thank you all for participating in the prayer and the scripture reading. Uh, I was asked if the scripture reading that I had uh, requested for this week was really the one that I intended because we had read it a couple of times before. And uh, I uh, responded by saying, yes, yes, it is in fact the same scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, because we are going to hover on that uh, passage for a little while. And the reason is very simple. Uh, when we study uh, the, uh, the, the attributes of God, when we study about God, we have no choice but to linger here because this is where we find the centrality of the doctrine of God that is spoken of in ways that it is not in other parts of the Bible. And so uh, I'm forced to stay here, and we will stay here for a few weeks uh, for a couple of reasons, because I have a couple of confessions to make as usual. I know we're not Catholic, and uh, Catholics usually make confessions where the congregation before it goes before the priest. Here the pastor goes before the congregation uh, the conf to make confessions. Uh, confession is this, the more I study on the subject of the holiness of God, I'm forced to understand God in ways that I've never understood before. Amen. Because in understanding the holiness of God, I'm forced to compare the other attributes of God. The other attributes of God. His omnipotence. He's all-powerful. His omnipresence. He's everywhere. He's omniscience. He's aware of everything. He is infallible. He is his wrath, his love, his self-dependence, his immortality. When we study all of those, all of those attributes of God, become special when we cover them under the umbrella of His holiness. His holiness is the overarching attribute that covers every other attribute of God. There is nothing about Him that is not holy. Everything about Him, His is holy. Any idea that we may have of holiness comes from Him. It is important for humans to understand who God is. And we cannot understand that without understanding His holiness. And it is from the knowledge of God it is from understanding God that every human being behaves in the way he or she behaves. Irrespective of what faith you claim, if you are Hindu, if you are Buddhist, if you are Sikh, if you are Muslim, even if you are an atheist, if you're a Roman Catholic or a Protestant, no matter who you are, your understanding of God affects how you behave. If you believe that God is a loving and a gentle God, and He is going to forgive everything. And that God has no wrath. God has no anger. God has no disappointment. Then your life will show that I can do whatever I want. And God is going to forgive me. And I will be in heaven. If you think that God is judgmental. And He will punish me. Then I will behave toward those around me. In that judgmental way. If I think that my God requires me to go and kill all non-believers, then I will go and behave that way. If I believe there is no God, my life will show that in the way that I live. 
The knowledge of God, the depth of knowledge of God is imperative to transform the way we live. Because the way, what we believe is what we do. A.W. Tozer wrote about this in a marvelous book called The Knowledge of God. And by the way, I should make another confession that I am not a systematic theologian. People who are systematic the the uh, theologians are well-studied people who have uh, doctorates, not, a, now not your basic doctoral degree, but they have a uh, doctorate in theology. And what a doctorate in theology means is you do four years of bachelor's, two years, not one year, but two years, sometimes three years in a master's program, and then several years, maybe four to six to eight years in a doctoral program, and also means you have to learn Hebrew and Greek, German and French, and Latin, and if you happen to do a special paper in another language, then you would have to also learn that language. Not just learn it basically, but to be able to learn it to write major papers in those languages. And so it is, because of my inability to be a theologian, I depend on great giants who are theologians. Like D.A. Carson, F.F. F. Bruce, R.C. Sproul, A.W. Tozer, A.W. Pink. These are people that have written about the godliness of God, the holiness of God. And the more I study, the more I realize how little I know. And the more I acknowledge that there are giants of theology with whom we are blessed throughout history and even alive today. We're grateful for them. That we can see God through their eyes and through the eyes of the prophets. There's one area that has caught my attention in this passage in Isaiah chapter 6 that I have not yet found in my theologian heroes. And I hope one day that I can find more information on it. I'm sure it's there. I just haven't found it yet. And that was a curiosity that came upon me. And I began to think, in systematic theology, we can talk about the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, ecclesiastiology, and pneumatology, sot soteriology. We can study all the various sciences of theology. But in order for me to understand who I am, I have to study and know the doctrine of sin. And the doctrine of sin is meaningless unless I know the doctrine of holiness. And holiness comes only from God. And so I'm compelled, week after week, to come back to the subject of the holiness of God. And when we focus on the holiness of God, it is through that, only that, that I can begin to see why I need Jesus Christ. It is the holiness of Christ that brings me back to the holiness of God from whom I was torn apart by Adam and Eve. And studying God in this chapter, I became curious. And I thought, why is it that Isaiah starts this chapter by saying, in the year that King Isaiah died? Why is that important? Mind you, I know that Isaiah didn't divide up the chapters into chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I know that. But why is it that in this chapter we find, in the year, this part of his testimony, why is it in the year that King Isaiah died? Why is that important? Or is that important at all? And in that study, I began to notice that there was something about Uzziah that put him in comparison to God, in contrast to God, 
We find the story of Isaiah in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. He's mentioned in a couple of other places as well. We started last week by saying that he was king at the age of 16. He reigned for 52 years. And at the time of Isaiah, he had been the longest reigning king. The longest that ever anybody had ever reigned. Later on, I believe Manasseh was longer than he. But nobody had been king for this long. And what was it about his kingdom that was so special? When he became king, he took over a country that wasn't all that great, was in trouble. But because of him, he brought in rules. He began to, he began to worship God in ways that God wanted. His kingdom grew in strength and power and prosperity. He started new ways of agriculture that they'd never used before. So they had better grains, better harvest than ever before. He built fortresses in ways they had never built before. Where they could build out a portion of the walls. Where they could shoot back arrows down toward the enemies climbing the walls. He developed new machines that they had never had before. Machines of war. And machines that made life easier. Economy was growing. He trained his army. Do you know at his time, way back then, do you know he had the biggest army back then? Right now, I believe we, uh, that, that Russia has an army of about 300,000 soldiers. And I understand India has got, the, I think, the second largest, 1.2 million or something like that. But 300,000 soldiers, and we know how powerful Russia is. At that time, King Uzziah had an army of 307,000 soldiers. You want to talk about power? That's huge. The country, not only his country, but all the then known lands sang praises to the king of Israel. Because of the Egyptian influence on Israel, we have evidence in the Bible that Jews began to look at their kings as gods because they were called the sons of gods. Not the god Jehovah, but like miniature gods. They gave them that kind of titles. They put them up on high. He was special of all the kings. And then he became so special that his, his kingdom and his reputation went all over the world. Other kings used to send him gifts to make sure that they remained friends and to gain favor of the king of Israel. And the king of Israel became proud. He was proud to look at his people. The temples used to be filled with, with worshipers. Filled with worshipers. But the worshipers didn't have the heart of worship. You know why? Because of the success and prosperity. We see churches today that are full, packed with believers because somebody has convinced them that prosperity equals a relationship with God. They come to church, sing songs, go home happy and gain no relationship with God because they don't know God. They know entertainment. They know feel good. And that's exactly what was happening in Israel. Not only were the people losing their relationship with God, but their king was losing relationship with God to the extent that he became proud and he went into the temple. And he went there to the altar of sacrifice where they sacrificed animals, altar of incense, and there he began to put incense on the altar. And the priests came to him and said, No, this is not your work. We're told 80 priests... Sons of Aaron 
went to him and said, no, you cannot do that. They began to chase him out. And when they told him to leave, he became angry because his heart was filled with pride. I am so special. I am so powerful. Who are you to tell me? And leprosy came on his face. It was required. It was required by law. That if you were a leper, you had to be separated from the people. And wherever you went, you had to scream out, Unclean! Unclean! That the people may walk or run away from you so they don't come in, in contact with the leprosy, with the unclean. This righteous king, successful king, now had to walk around, if he was going to walk among his people, and say, unclean, unclean. He was taken away from the palace and put in a house outside the city where he lived the rest of his life. And when he died, in the year that he died, all of Israel went into mourning. All of Israel went into mourning because even while he was not in his palace, he still influenced the happenings in Israel through his son. When he died, the hope of the people died with them. Their prosperity died with him. Their celebration died with him. No more were they special. Their power died with him. And it is my belief that in this chapter, the reason Isaiah says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. When we make for ourselves gods, when we make for ourselves mansions, when we make for ourselves reputations, when we make for ourselves influence, when we make for ourselves power, when we make for ourselves our own name, and pride begins to fill our hearts, we must come to the realization that kings are also human and they come to an end. But that same God who was there, who made Uzziah king when he was 16 and allowed him to reign for 52 years, when the king Uzziah died, God in heaven was still on his throne. And when the influence of Uzziah went through all the countries and filled the land, the robe, the train of the robe of God filled the entire temple. That means God's power, His influence covered the entire earth, the entire known universe. And when Uzziah died, His influence died with Him. But God's influence remains today. I believe it is for that reason that Uzziah mentioned in the year the, that Isaiah mentioned that in the year Uzziah died, because to those that he was writing to, those that were going to read Isaiah's book, to those that him, him he was preaching, they knew about Uzziah, and they would make that connection. But to us, it doesn't mean anything unless we begin to dig into the Word of God. When we look at Isaiah, and we look at this passage now, with this view, we see God sitting where? High on a throne. What does he say? I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. High and exalted. In the year that King Uzziah died, where was he? On his throne? No, he was not. He was banished to a house outside the city. 
That is what happens to the highest, the strongest, the most powerful, sinful man who thinks he is righteous. That's where he is when God is on the throne, high and exalted, controlling the entire universe. That is where King Uzziah is. And the train of his robe filled what? The entire temple. The temple. Where in the temple was Uzziah when he got leprosy? Where was he? He was only at the altar. He was only at the altar. The altar where they sacrificed the animals and poured incense. But where is God? God is not only at the altar. He is seated at the throne in that sanctuary. Not that sanctuary on earth. That sanctuary on heaven. He is in heaven. And God is not only at that altar. God is in the entire altar. Sitting at the throne. That is the God that we worship. And at that time, when, when, when Uzziah stood there, with his pride, that his evidence of his righteousness was shown in the land, through the riches, through the success, he could show the evidence that he was in fact a righteous king, loved by God. At that time, when he saw his righteousness, he was struck with leprosy. And his righteousness was shown to be unclean. 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 That is Uzziah. That is the righteousness of Uzziah. When we begin to gauge our righteousness by our success, my friends, there's a problem. And when... He gets leprosy. He is chased out of the temple. And we see here the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings that covered their faces, with two of their feet, and with two they were flying. In the temple, when Uzziah is there, who else is there? Who else is there? The preachers. The priests are there. And what do they say to Uzziah? You think you're righteous? Get out of here! Get out of the temple! That is your king? That is who you call the Lord of Israel? Look at God. Who is there in His presence? Seraphs. Those that have never sinned, unlike the priests who were also sinful beings. God is surrounded by seraphs, angels, the highest of angels. And the highest of angels cannot bear to look upon the face of God and so they cover their faces. They cover their faces. Compare that to what happened with Uzziah. They cover their feet and they're flying because they're doing the work of God. And what is their answer? What is their saying? Holy Holy, holy. The word holy, in English, we would say, if you were going to explain to somebody what is the most holy that you can be, we would say, holy, holier, holiest. Right? The people in church are holy. The head elder is holier. And the pastor, not this church, another church, <laughs> is the holiest. <laughs> not this church. Holiest. Is there anything holier than holiest? Is there anything holier than holiest? Nothing. 
The source of holiness is God. In Hebrew language, the way to express holy or anything three times is the most you can go. You cannot do more than that. All holiness in this world comes from one source. All holiness anywhere in the world comes from one source, and that source is God. He is the only one that is holy. Every other holiness is borrowed or given, donated, if you will, by God. We can choose to accept it or reject it. Just like mortality is given by God. Immortality is given by God. Adam and Eve had temporary immortality. If they had not sinned, they had lived forever. But when they sinned, life itself comes from God. When we look at the condition of the people in Israel, we look at chapter 5 of Isaiah, and chapter 5 is full of Isaiah looking at the people of Israel and telling them, listen to this, chapter 5, verse 8, Woe to you! Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left, and you live alone in the land. What does that mean? What does the word woe mean? It's like a curse. You're cursed. You don't have a good future. Woe to you who, who, who add house to house, land to land, field to field. Then it says, the Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A ten-acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine, a homer of seed only an epaph of grain. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks and stay up late at night till are all in flame and so on. Now he goes on and on and on in chapter 5. And Isaiah begins to point out the sins and selfishness and greed of the people of God. You call yourselves a people of God and you go chasing money and success and pleasure? That's what was happening in Israel at the time. I have to ask the question, was Isaiah talking to me? Because that message of Isaiah is true for us today. It is true for us today. We are chasing prosperity and success at the price of giving up our relationship with our God. We allocate a certain amount of time for God. That's it. We take and say, this is my church time. This is my prayer time. This is my Bible study time. In reality, all of our time belongs to God. And within that time of God, we have some work to do. We may have to go play a game of soccer or read a book. But still within the confines of obeying and living the, God, the way God wants us to live. Amen. Just as the holiness of God is all-encompassing in all the attributes of God, the holiness of his people that comes from him is all encompassing all of the attributes of our humanity and all of the activities of our humanity. I'm compelled to ask the question of myself. Have I seen God? Have I got to know God? Because I know. I know. That when we meet God, we are forced to go down on our knees and confess that we are sinful, in need of a Savior, in need of salvation. Too often, we compare our righteousness to others. 
around us. That is why Jesus says, don't judge others. Because compared to others, we look pretty good. <laughs> Seriously. Especially those of us that are Seventh-day Adventists. We do everything right. Look, here's the Bible. Look at us. We do everything right. You guys are. You're in trouble. It's very easy. We need not to look at one another. We don't need to point out anybody's sin. We need to point out to God that He may point out our sin. And that may cause us to run to Jesus Christ. It is only through the holiness of Jesus Christ that we can be holy. And anybody that is not holy cannot abide with God. Look at the seraphim. They're perfectly holy. Sinless. And yet, they wouldn't dare open their eyes to look at God. How can we? There is a direct relationship to our knowledge of God, to our behavior toward Him. It is because of that lack of knowledge that we have casualized our relationship with God. We have made Him a buddy. You brought Him down to our level. We don't prepare our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our clothes to meet Him. We need to ask God to show us his attributes, that we may be driven to Him, that we may want to be like Him. And the only way that we can do that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. Through Jesus Christ. He is the only answer for us. And so it is that it is my hope that as we continue studying, the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the God that never changes, the same yesterday, today, and forever, that same God that Isaiah could not look upon, we cannot look upon today. And do you notice what happened to Isaiah? In chapter 5, he goes on and talks to the people and he says, Woe unto you! Woe unto you! Woe unto you! Woe unto you! Curse on you! Curse on you! Curse on you! Because you don't follow God! And then when he sees God, he says what? Woe unto, Woe unto me. me. Woe unto me. It is my hope that through these little sermons, I can help all of us to search out God Amen. in our own homes, in our own Bibles. And then, like Chuck Colson, I'll tell you, I don't know many of you would remember Chuck Colson. I was a big Richard Nixon fan as a kid. Uh, my dad allowed me to skip school, believe it or not, and listen to the Watergate hearings, if you, some of you that are old enough would remember. Chuck Colson was a White House lawyer, attorney. Also ended up in jail for a certain time. He ended up studying the character, the holiness of God. And he says... When he understood the holiness of God, he fell on his knees and he cried like a baby because he understood what it means to be a sinner. My friends, the reason that we will continue studying the holiness of God is because in order for us to have a reformation in our hearts and see the need of Jesus Christ, we need to study the holiness of God. I was warning somebody last week that it seems like the more I study, the deeper I study, it seems like I'll be preaching about the subject for the next two years. It's so deep. And sad to say, I am afraid of the transformations that are taking place in my life because it's not easy to change your life when God requires it. And it is my hope that in some small way, our studies here will cause God's power to change all of our lives and drive us to the study of the Word of God, because that is where we find our God Amen. and our Savior. Amen. Bless you.
Merciful Father, we come before you just now, dear God, to ask you to please accept us as we review our lives, and dear God, we ask you to please forgive us, accept us, transform us, that we could stand in your presence today and every day with the blessing and the covering of Jesus Christ. I pray for every member of this congregation just now, dear Father, every family that is represented. Those that are not here today, dear Father, we ask a blessing for those. We ask you, dear God, to use us in the way that you want us to. That as Isaiah answered, we too may answer, here am I, send me. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.